soybean crop conditions in Argentina and its impact. And also, we are going to take a look about the wheat futures right here on Connected Pharma, your channel to keep you up to date with the latest trends in agriculture and livestock. So basically, Jeff, uh, uh, Jerry, sorry, uh, we uh, had a week uh, with more bad news for Argentina, especially for its soybean crops. But also, uh, we are going to to have a, an impact on the wheat crop. Yes, yes. Well, uh, the uh, South American weathers at this point. Um, Actually, the we had some rains on the weekend that was in some parts of uh, Buenos Aires and Cordoba, and then we had a kind of a surprise one that popped up in here yesterday. Uh, and that actually it was in the northern sections of Cordoba and Santa Fe, and that it it, it didn't really hit the core area, but it definitely uh, kind of did us a head fake there with that. And in general, there's not a lot of forecasted moisture again. Now, the one thing it kind of <laughs> happened here behind this uh, kind of surprise uh, uh, thunderstorm that came through there in uh, Cordoba and Santa Fe was it was cold temperatures uh, swung down in there. They were talking about some potential uh, freeze uh, situation. It turned out to be maybe a frost. There was some 36, 37 degree temperatures there. Uh, but so it probably did not uh, uh have a big input uh, specifically from a cold weather situation, but considering the heat and the dryness we've had in Argentina, what a what a head fake there to come back and worry about freeze uh, situations come in for one day. Maybe maybe there's something will happen again uh, over the weekend here. But in general, uh, that uh, the Argentine weather was there, but it just didn't uh, get enough people uh, fired up to really. Uh, put ourselves into uh, enthusiastic situations here uh, after we had the pig push on, on Friday and Monday of this week we've uh, sank back midweek and then we bounced back again that's what really turned out to be a, you know a sideways trended market for all the markets uh, at, or excuse me all the corn soybeans and even the wheat market here too uh, the uh, wheat market uh uh, interesting scenario at this point. Uh, the uh, Argentine crop is pretty well known, really tough, uh, tough situation there. Uh, looks like that uh, Australia's crop is going to be uh, you know, pretty good out there. Uh, the, the biggie at this point is going to end up being uh, India coming ahead of us here at this point. So far, uh, it's kind of like last year, lots of optimism about the crop ahead of the harvest that really happens here probably a month from now on through April and that. But a year ago, we had uh, some significant heat over there, which tends to be the case uh, many, many years here for India. So uh, to some extent, that's uh, one side of the question right now. The uh, other thing that's really the biggie in wheat at this point will be the beginnings of the negotiations that will start the end of next week. Uh, for the potential re uh, renewal of the Black Sea uh, Black Sea uh, export corridor, and that uh, lots of uh, posturing back and forth. Uh, uh, to some extent, the uh, uh, Russians are talking about uh, the the sanctions, and I don't know. There's no Pacific sanctions on exports. There is some issues involving the financial side of things, but so far, at least. Uh, the um, uh, Russians have been able to uh, uh, find different ways around that. And, uh, Jerry, uh, I want to jump into that because a year ago, exactly a year ago, uh, the <laughs> war was uh, starting. And uh, looking at those prices right now, we have, we have $9. And comparing to the last year's prices where all these tensions were just starting, I, I don't think... Uh, there is much, much room to further growth in those prices. 
Well, that's the thing. Uh, there's lots of volatility potential in these wheat prices to say, well, how things got emotional last year, and rightly so, when you ended up having the breadbasket of the world there, uh, Ukraine, uh, under huge stress, uh, and the fact that the exports uh, really got shut down from this February period uh, through uh, through uh, till it was basically uh, late July and August before they started getting this corridor together. And to some extent, there's been some. It's been helpful uh, for Ukraine, but it's also helpful to a lot of countries around the world and, uh, that needed this wheat and corn out of that area. And uh, so uh, the biggest thing, though, is the Ukrainians continue to have issues about how the uh, Russians are inspecting things and how they're kind of dragging their feet about different things. And so uh, both sides have got uh, lots of posturing going on. It'll be interesting how that gets worked out uh, from that standpoint. Uh, right at this point or at this juncture in the, in the prices and that uh, we're dealing with a potentially big India crop. And right now, at least we don't have a great uh, th uh, Pacific threat uh, on what the North American crops are going to look like at this point. So uh, we've had some warm weather uh, above normal weather, I should say across uh, Russia and North and uh, also, well, even across the U S and Europe, both. And, Somehow or other, that could make things vulnerable if something went too far ahead and all of a sudden we had a big cold spell. So there's a lot of things out here in the wheat market. In the short term, though, we're just kind of biding our time, unfortunately, here for the wheat market in the short term. Yeah, and next week uh, we have our new numbers from the USDA on Wednesday. Uh, what do you, do you think will be new? Well, the, the USDA... Uh, <clears throat> uh, during their agricultural outlook forum that they will uh, uh, have on Thursday and Friday of next week. You know, this is in DC. It's been going on. I've been to that conference in the past, uh, probably two or three times and that, and uh, it's an interesting uh, opportunity for meeting people across the whole U S agricultural markets from the uh, uh, people in the uh, uh, academia to uh, people in the export world and also trading world along the way. It's it, it's kind of the first salvo, if you will, uh, on what the USDA might be uh, thinking here. Now, they did put out a thing called the baseline projections back in November. They just recently popped those up again here this week uh, to kind of remind people, I guess, what they had put out then. The interesting twist on it is, is that... <laughs> There, there could be some adjustments from those numbers, particularly in the wheat, because I don't think that they expected uh, the big, big jump in winter wheat, and particularly in one state there of Texas, uh, of 1.6 million additional acres. And that, uh, <clears throat> so that does end up uh, having an impact. Now, we probably are going to have some dump, more double crop uh, soybeans behind wheat, and also we could have some of that wheat that was planted being grazed out in reality, not part of the uh, uh, total uh, corn, soybeans, and wheat situation in that. But uh, that's going to be co uh, watched closely here. The USDA actually had a 92 million number uh, on uh, last fall on corn, which would be up from the 88 to, <clears throat> 88 to 5, I think it was, or 88 to 6, I guess, uh, from there. Uh, and uh, soybeans um, did a minor increase there from the uh, 87 and a half million number uh, last fall. I think the, in general, maybe it's the high cost of some fertilizer, high cost of energy prices and chemicals might bring that uh, corn number down. I'm looking actually for a 90.85 number. Uh, there's lots of people out there, that are lots of different uh, range of number. I think they come from about 90.85 five up to actually as high as 93 actually is a, there's a range from one of the bigger fertilizer providers here uh, in north america and a 91 to 93 number it's that really isn't really helpful but it's thrown out there so uh uh at that and and to some extent uh corn prices and, and the cash actually have been pretty strong uh, and you put the ratios of those prices in there and it does favor uh, some corn. I think there will be more in corn. I think the one thing 
that might be a factor in this thing, though, in some of the plain states is that uh, the moisture situation still is not good. Western half of Iowa on through Nebraska, South Dakota, Kansas, uh, North Dakota, maybe a little bit better. But uh, in general here, I think that, you know, soybeans don't take as much uh, input uh, and that, and also not as much uh, in the, in the world of um, moisture. So uh, the interesting twist on it is right now that uh, uh, the the big weather uh, projections for this year is that the current La Nina that's still hanging on, but it's getting less and less intense, uh, and that could flip over potentially towards an, uh, El Nino, El Nino uh, and that – but uh, that might not show up officially because you move really from a minus one on La Nina to a plus one on the uh, sea surface temperatures. And that is when you officially become an El Nino. And that might not have come until late summer or even fall. But uh, the impact of it is, is that uh, moving towards uh, each side of the uh, kind of uh, sea surface temperature along the equator is... Uh, is going to be psychologically important. Uh, it's already having an impact. Everybody keeps anticipating that we're going to have the, uh, a lot better yields. And I think we will have better, better yields. I'm not sure we're going to flip over to the top side of uh, our yield potential. That's one of the things I think will be watched closely too here uh, uh, on Thursday and Friday is what does the USDA use for yields? Uh, last year we had uh, 173 and a half and some people are as high as 181. I'm kind of cautious of 178, 179 at this point. I kind of feel like that's there unless we, uh, and even with some uh, uh, weather problems in the Western uh, Corn Belt, we could have still that kind of yield, but I'm not sure we're guaranteed a 181. That's the problem. We've been talking about these 180 yields uh, on trend uh, for, I don't know, four or five years at this point, even maybe six back in the, uh, 2017, 2018 year, and when they first got to just below 177, and we haven't been able to get there, so we'll have to watch that. Beans, I'm kind of looking for a 51 uh, number on that. The twist of it is, is, is uh, that uh, <clears throat> the man side of this market is going to be. Uh, where I anticipate some slight increases from this year on both corn and soybeans, or modest, I should say, uh, in that. But uh, will that come through? The Chinese are a huge, huge uh, uh, question mark out here. They're trying to move and uh, to punish the U.S. by going to South America and by they've already bought some corn. They hope to get a lot more corn. Will that uh, second crop corn in, in Brazil actually be as good as uh, is anticipated on the bean side of things? Uh, they really won't be, won't be able to buy much from uh Argentina with their weather issues knocking their crops down, but in Brazil maybe they're, they're going to take a lot of beans down there too. So uh, the the big uh, unknown is uh, what China is going to do in 2023 uh, and how they approach things because uh, they're just kind of coming out of their COVID situation over there. And how much does that mean? Will there be more meat demand? Does that mean more? feed demand, uh, these kind of things. Lots of unknowns ahead of us for 2023, and I guess we'll continue to battle to find out what they turn out to be. All right, so let's check. Thank you very much. You bet, and we'll, I'll be really interested to see how the USDA kind of does their numbers. Are they just going to punt and use the same ones they had, or are they going to actually make some adjustments here? I think in wheat they might have to make some adjustments and how that impacts the other two. Uh, corn and soybeans is always going to be important to watch. You have a good weekend, though, and enjoy the extra day off.